Okay, we're going to start this lesson by taking a look at this position. And like always, I need you to pause the video and think of what you do next if you were the black pieces. Alright guys, so I know that I have mentioned the bishop pair here and there, but today it is finally time to dedicate one lesson to how to use it. So in this lesson, it's very simple. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this first position that we had. Then I'm going to show you an entire game played by Floor against Botvinnik. And you're going to see how Floor went from this position, the Nimso Indian defense, all the way to this position where he kept the pair of bishops. But as you can see, the position is locked and we should know from lesson number 74 that bishops really enjoy open positions but still we're going to learn what to do when the position is like this and you're going to see how floor got from this position to this one where clearly the bishops are dominating the white pieces have to be winning now every time someone talks about the pair of bishops we imagine the bishops powerful controlling the diagonals everything is open but that part is easy, the difficult part is what to do when the center is locked, what are we supposed to do? Now, rumor has it that when Botvinnik lost this game back in 1933, he got his computer, he went online, he found this video, and he learned how to use the pair of bishops. So we're going to finish the lesson with another game where Botvinnik actually had the pair of bishops and he won the game. And I'm not going to analyze it, I'm just going to use it to test if you guys learned something in this lesson. So let's get to it. First, let me put this initial position over here. And if we do this right, when we analyze the game, you're gonna have a very good idea of what to do once Floor got his pair of bishops with the position locked. So anyways, guys, what we need to keep in mind whenever we have the pair of bishops is that, of course, something that you know, bishops like open positions, open diagonals, but also we need to remember two other things. Number one, one of the main benefits of having the pair of bishops is that you can give it up whenever you like. So if you find the opportunity to get a better position by trading one of the bishops for a knight or for another bishop, well, you know that you have that as well. So you put pressure with the pair of bishops, you use it, but if you have to let it go, that's perfectly fine if you're going to get some good benefit for it. And then finally, and this is extremely important, Guys, once we have our bishops active, don't forget, bishops need targets, and those targets are pawns. Now, if you have ever listened to Pink Floyd, there's one song where he says, together we stand, divided we fall. Well, rumor has it that he was talking about the pawns in chess. Pawns, they are really good when they are next to each other, they're protecting each other, but when they are isolated, we know that that's going to be a very good target for our pieces. So in this position, the first move is a move that it is going to first allow us to open up diagonals. And more importantly, if we don't do it, guys, the white pieces are going to do c4 and they're going to lock the position. So c4, we sacrifice the pawn. And now again, we open up the position and we're going to start dividing those pawns. So now if they take with the d pawn, notice how we can just go ahead and capture only four. And then we got, besides the open position, we got two connected passed pawns. And then, of course, if they take with a b-pawn, like they did in this game, the moment that pawn is uh, captures, we're going to have a new open diagonal for our pieces. Now, I'm not going to show you the entire game, guys, but just for you to see more or less what they did with the pair of bishops. After bishop a4, we have bishop g4. They're happy to see you give up the pair of bishops but instead the black pieces went bishop e6 now king h1 notice how this king is completely out of the game instead of being helping like they should be in the end game so after king h1 we have bishop c2 and this is what i was talking to you about the target so we divided the pawns now this bishop is going after this left behind pawn and we could even go after this isolated pawn as well so after knight to b2 we have Pawn to f3, then knight to d2, and then bishop a5 going after another target. And I think, guys, that you're seeing the idea now. And even though they could take on f3, knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, after bishop c3, it is obvious that the bishops are way more powerful than the pair of minor pieces that the white pieces have. And from here, the rest of those weak pawns are going to fall. Now, with those principles in mind, let's take a look at the entire game. Again, 
Floor is playing with the white pieces, Botvinnik is playing with the black pieces, and we get to this very popular, very good Nimso Indian defense. Now, notice how from the very beginning, it looks like the black pieces want to give up the pair of bishops, but in reality, the main objective of this opening is to fight for the e4 square. So this bishop, the main task is to pin the knight so that the black pieces could occupy e4. And you're going to see, if you've reviewed enough games with this opening, you're going to see that the black pieces typically just retreat. They want to keep that bishop. Now, after bishop b4, the white pieces did a very popular continuation, which is queen c2. I don't think it's that popular anymore. But queen c2, the main idea is to protect the knight with the queen. If they take, well, we don't have to... Actually, let me go back here. If we had done e3, which I think is more popular now, if they take, notice how we have to get doubled and isolated pawn, which is not a big deal. You get compensation because of the pair of bishops, but many people prefer to just go queen c2, and if this happened, we keep the pawn structure healthy. So it's completely up to your style. You have to review them both and then pick the one that you like the most. Now, after queen to c2, the black pieces went pawn to c5. And by the way, guys, this came became very popular because of the way that Floor used the pair of bishops, but also because Botvinnik, after he lost this game, he started to play here pawn to d5 instead. And he actually got really good results with d5 instead of c5. So this is very important. If something is not working out for you, try to improve it and maybe you find an alternative. But anyways, in this game we have pawn to c5, then d takes c5, and the black pieces, instead of capturing with the bishop, they developed another piece to collect on c5. And now immediately the white pieces just ask the question, pawn to a3, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay there for me to take? Are you going to give me the pair of bishops? Or are you going to move back and maybe I could even expand at the expense of, of that bishop. So the black pieces just took on c3 and then you see the first imbalance here. The black pieces gave up the pair of bishops and of course the white pieces just captured with the queen. Our pawn structure is healthy. This doubled pawn is an extra pawn that we just took and we know they're going to take it right back. Now at this point, guys, again, feel free to pause the video and try to think of what you do next as the white pieces. If you have no idea, you've never seen a game with this opening, you have never played it, even better. Just try to understand the position and see what you do next here as the white pieces. Well, if you were familiar with this opening from before, or if you were paying attention to what I said before, you should know that the black pieces really want to occupy e4. This is the key square for them. So if we're the white pieces, we understand that one of those knights is going to get there. Well, the easiest way to take care of it is pawn to f3. I know that it looks a little bit weird, but in this case, it is possible because if they ever did something to prevent e4, notice that after e4, the, the, our position is going to look good again. But if they did something like d5 to prevent you from doing e4, well, we could just take on d5 and then this knight is going to be hit, right? So ideally, they would want something like this, but the knight would fall. So just because of that, we're safe. And also, another thing that could look a little bit weird about this move is that this diagonal is going to be uncomfortable for the white pieces. But don't forget that the black pieces gave up the dark square bishop. So that diagonal is going to be hard for them to put pressure on. So anyways, after pawn to f3, we have pawn to d6. Now pawn to e4 already looking good. And we have pawn to e5. Now guys, not that this is a bad move or anything like that, but for all of you following this course, the moment this pawn was pushed, two things should have pop tab on the board. Number one, this left behind pawn, we know that we could put pressure on it, especially since they don't have the dark square bishop. And like you should know, in front of any left behind pawn, in front of any isolated pawn, there is a weak square, a square that cannot be protected by another pawn. Now, why do I say it is not a bad move? Why did the black pieces, why did Botvinnik play e5 if it creates all of these weaknesses? Well, guys, in this case, they don't want this pawn blocking the bishop. So if we have one bishop left, we're supposed to place our pawns opposite to the color of that bishop. Now, these pawns are going to control the dark squares that the other bishop is not controlling. And this bishop is going to be in charge of the light squares and at the same time has some uh, freedom to get out and, and be active. So pawn to e5 happened and now bishop e3, very natural move. And by the way, of course, we're not planning to just take on c5. We're just putting the bishop here 
because it is active, it has a very good scope. Just count the amount of squares that we are controlling with that bishop. Now, if you thought of doing something like before with the tempo and then bishop b2, it just doesn't make much sense because that bishop would be hitting against that pawn, which is pretty solid, pretty well defended. So instead, we just went e5, bishop e3, now queen to c7, knight goes to e2, we keep developing minor pieces, bishop e6, notice how the bishop is coming to a very good square, and now we have queen to c2. Now feel free to try to understand, try to come up with the explanation of queen to c2. So why would the white pieces move the queen again in the opening, when they haven't developed this bishop, when they haven't castled? Well, it has to do exactly with that. If we want to improve this bishop, we need to first move the knight, and the question is, and I know that we have talked about this, but whenever we need to improve a piece, we gotta ask ourselves, what would be the best square for that piece, in this case a knight? If we were floating in the air and I could place it anywhere, where would I put it? Well, either d5 or b5. Now, to get there, I need to be on c3, and that's why the queen just backed up to c2, followed by knight to c3. So, after queen to c2, the black piece is finally castled, then knight goes to c3, rook f to c8, semi-open file, they're going to be putting pressure on c4, and now bishop to e2, pawn to a6, and then rook to c1. Guys, rook to c1 is simple, we know that they're putting pressure on c4 indirectly, so we're bringing pieces to defend it as well, and anyways, this rook needs to be developed sooner or later. So, rook to c1, and now knight to d7, again, putting pressure on c4, so queen to d2 for the white pieces. Now, it looks like we're dropping the pawn, but in reality, that pawn cannot be captured since the rook is on the same file as the queen. Now, as a general rule, you don't want to have your queen on the same file as a rook, you don't want to have your queen on the same diagonal as a bishop. Right now, it could be safe, but it could become a tactic later on. And right now, just to show you, if they had done bishop to c4, we have knight to d5, hitting the bishop, and you see how that pin is now going to be really, really dangerous. If they just take, well, we could do rook takes e4, hitting the queen, and then we collect on d5. So, of course, they did not capture on c4. Instead, they just went queen to b8. Notice how the queen looks very weird, but it is better than just having it on the same file as the white rook. So, queen b8, we have knight goes to d5, bishop takes d5, c takes e5 and now we're getting really close to the position that i showed you before so after c takes e5 they just simplified the game and by the way here uh botvinik said after the game that he was trying to get to this end game so quickly because he thought he would be getting good chances since the position was locked but later on he acknowledged that he was his judgment was was wrong and he should have instead before he should have done something like king f8 and maybe not trade so many pieces but anyways after queen c1, we have queen to d8. Now, the white piece is here castled, and this is very interesting because even though the white piece is castled, when I was reviewing this game, the move that came to mind was, okay, if this is an end game, or at least it's looking like it's going to get to an end game quickly, what if my king instead stays closer to the center? We know that kings want to be active in the end game, so if it's castled, it's gonna take him longer to get to the center. If I leave it on f2, it could be beneficial. So we gotta be from here already thinking of the end game. But anyways, Floor knows better, so he, he just castled. And then we have rook c8, queen goes to d2, queen c7, rook c1, and now finally all of these trades occurred and we got to this position. Now, guys, if you get to this position, what is your plan? What do you wanna do? And if you remember back in lesson uh, 90 something, we went over one of Capablanca's endgames and you saw how he approached the endgame. Instead of just calculating this move, that move, this variation, he's thinking of where he wants his pieces to be at, what his main plans and ideas are. So if I have the pair of bishops and I know that my bishops work better on open positions, I need to open up the position. So maybe something like f4 needs to be prepared. If I break this center down, if I clear this up, my bishops are going to be way superior to the knights. Now, the second part, and this is something that I have to admit, I myself, I didn't really understand this until later on. So I first learned about how the pair of bishops is better, how we, I need to open up the position, but here, something else that Floor does with the white pieces is to use the queenside pawns 
to limit the action of the knight. So we know that these knights might at some point go to c5 and b6, so moves like b4 could help us with that. So maybe before a4, a5, and it is going to limit them so that we can focus on the center and even the king side. So anyways, at this point, the black pieces just went king to f8, activating the king, and now king to f2. And see, this is what I was saying before. If we had just done king f2 before, maybe we would have saved the move. But anyways, after king f2, the king continues to come out. That's the natural thing to do. Now, bishop e3, then king goes to d8, coming to the, to the queen side. King e1, king to c7, king to d2, knight goes to c5, and now pawn to b4, the knight goes back to d7. And guys, this is already something to keep in mind. We gotta keep our opponent's pieces on the control, we don't want him to get any counterplay. That's why this king rushed to the queen side. We don't want them to be creating anything over there. So, and if you remember back in lesson, I want to say 110, actually last lesson, I had an endgame like that. It's, it was not this kind of endgame, but I was always trying to keep my opponent's counterplay at a minimum. Anyways, after the knight goes back to d7, we're going to start uh, working on clearing up that center or at least opening up our bishop. So g3. The knight goes back to b6, king to c2, our king is going to take care of the queen side, then knight b to d7, and this is a clear indication that the black pieces have no plan. Whenever I'm playing my games, I see my opponent going back and forth, I know they don't have a plan that tells me I have plenty of time to prepare whatever I'm working on. So anyways, at this point we have pawn to a4, remember, just trying to fix the queen side, and that way we don't have to worry about it anymore. So the knight goes to b6 a5, knight b to d7, they're just wasting time, and guys, don't forget, we're talking about Botvinnik, he definitely knows what he's doing, but it is just painful to play this kind of position. So, the knight goes finally to d7, now bishop c1, and the idea of bishop c1 is that we're going to, already we took care of the queen side, we're going to reroute this bishop now, so that when we do a4 at the right time, the bishop is going to be putting pressure on e5, but also putting pressure on the entire diagonal. So, bishop c1, we have king to d8. Now, they understood there's nothing for them to do on the queen side. Even if they ever tried to do something like b6, this bishop is putting pressure on a6, right? So, they understand that, and the king is coming over to the king side, where the pressure is going to start to build up. So, king goes to d8. Of course, bishop goes to b2, then knight e8. King goes to d2. Guys, before we do anything, we are going to maximize the, the king. This bishop is already pretty good. This one, maybe we improve it as well before we break. And we've talked about this a lot. Before we do that final break, we got to have our pieces the best they could be. We know that they have no plan, so we don't have to rush. So knight to c7, then the king goes to e3, king goes to e7, and now bishop to f1. Now, what's the idea behind this move? Again, before the very important break on f4, we're going to improve our bishop. We're going to put it on a better diagonal. And by the way, don't think this is any diagonal, guys. This bishop from here is going to be controlling that knight. Not that we want to take it, but if the knight ever moves, then that bishop is going to go after the pawns. Don't forget, we need targets. That b7 pawn is going to be one of the weakest targets. It's the base of that pawn chain, so if we could get to it, of course it is going to be hard to defend. So anyways, here we have knight to b5. Now, should we take that knight or not really? Well, of course not. We could give out the pair of bishops whenever we want, but it's not time. That knight is going nowhere. The bishop, look, we talked about this a lot. The bishop two squares away from the knight is controlling that knight. So instead, we want to activate the bishop, remember, through this diagonal, but let's first move the pawn to h4, gain more space, start moving forward, and then bishop h3. We don't want to do bishop h3 first, and then this pawn is going to be, uh, then the bishop is going to be in the way of, of the pawn. And of course, the most important thing is the black pieces have no plan, so we could actually use all of the time we want to prepare this as much as we can. So pawn to h4 happened, and now the knight goes back to c7, Finally, the bishop goes to h3, and then after knight e8, we are ready to do f4. Now, very important, I know that I have said it many times already, but look at this bishop, as active as it could be, very good diagonal. Look at this bishop as well, same thing, 
and our king is also very active on e3. So f4 at this moment, for anyone, this would be about opening up the position and activating the, the, the bishops. But you and I, guys, we know a little bit more. We know that we're also trying to create targets for our bishops to collect. So after pawn to f4, we have f6. If you know what you're doing as black, you want to keep the position locked for your knights to perform better than the bishops. And now again, it's a good moment for you guys to post a video and think of what you do if you were the one playing as the white pieces. Well, if you found here a move that is going to force the black pieces to create more weaknesses, well, congrats, the move is bishop f5. So again, the bishops are putting pressure on the targets and if we could, we know we're not going to get it, but if we could make them move and create more weaknesses, even better. So pawn to g6, of course doing h6 is going to create a weakness on g6 so our king could easily get there and put even more pressure. So g6 happened instead, we're going to go back, that's okay, we just wanted to create weaknesses in their pawn structure. So uh, the bishop went back, then we have pawn to h6 and now bishop to c1 guys. This bishop knows there's nothing to be done here, look at this, so we're going to try to put pressure on h6. And again, same thing that I've been repeating, the bishops are just looking for targets to put pressure on. So knight goes to g7, f takes e5, d takes e5. Look, this is immediately, you guys have to think of a protected pass pawn. This changes. Every time that a pawn moves, we have to pay attention to see what changed, to see how it helps us. If they had taken with the knight, remember the bishop is here, and we have another threat on b7, nothing they could do. If they had taken with the f-pawn, well, we move the king out of the way and we're hitting um, h6. If they push, look, weaknesses, the bishops are able to come in. I'm thinking the king has to go back to e8 to protect the knight. And I think after king e3, this is a suk swan position. And for those of you who are new to the channel, suk swan, guys, is when you just have no moves. Notice that anything that they do with the knight is going to either lose it or let me get to c8. If they move the knight, then they're going to collect it over here. And of course, the king is tied up to the defense of the other knight. So this is exactly what we call a suk swan position. And that's why instead they just went d takes e5 and they had to give the white pieces the protected passed pawn. So anyways, king f3 and discover attack on, on the pawn on h6, pawn to h5, bishop goes to e3, then king goes to d6. And now a very important move, which is bishop a6. Because, guys, if we want to make progress, we have to break on g4, but we don't want the knight ready to jump to h5. So we want to make his pieces passive, and only then we're going to do g4. Now, there's no option. If they don't take, I'm going to take them, and that's going to be an isolated pawn, perfect target for our light square bishop. So they had to take, bishop takes on g4, knight goes to c7, and now the bishop comes back to e3, knight goes to b5, King goes to e2. Guys, remember, no counterplay. The king needs to be, like we talked in our last lesson, the king has to be there to help us. So, king goes to e2, knight to c7, nothing to worry about that knight coming in here. And now, the other thing is that this knight he needs to be defending e6. This bishop is ready to just go in f7 and put pressure on g6. And at that point, if this pawn pushes, not only can we just win it, but we could just do h5 and get a passed pawn. So anyways, in this position, this is sort of like another suk swan, so king to d3, and all of the pieces are again unable to do anything. This knight, again, needs to be defending a6, so f5 happened, pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop f5, and now even though the black pieces could take on d5, after bishop d2, look, the same pattern, the bishop is controlling that knight, we have an outside pass pawn which with the pair of bishops, it is just too much of an asset for the white pieces. So this pawn is not going to go anywhere. And remember, this knight is unable to move because the bishop could come over and help. And again, now you're seeing in action all of the things that we talked about back in lesson number 74. When there are pawns on both sides of the board, bishops are better. And when the position is open, the same thing. And to make things even worse, there are targets pawns that are fixed that we can simply put pressure on. And at this point, the black pieces continue with knight f6. Guys, I'm going to leave it here. You could do bishop c8, even though it wasn't what the what the white pieces uh, did in the game. And I think that Flo did not do it because they don't want to give their opponent any chances to draw the game or anything like that. Now, I think bishop c8 is extremely powerful, but 
Even if you keep it cool, if you continue to put pressure, you're going to win this game. Now, remember that you could go to the description of the video and find the, the link to the entire game. But also guys, what I really want you to do if you have the time is, like we have talked in another lessons, take this position, I'm going to leave you the PGN, you're going to go to tools and you're going to just paste it here. So you copy the PGN, you paste it here, enter. And once you have the position, I know it's not this one, but once you have the position, you're going to go and continue from here versus the computer and you pick the level that you typically play with. So if you typically play with five, uh, level five, you hit you want to be whatever side you want to be on, white or black. And you could also play with a time control. You could do 15 minutes if that's okay. And try to finish this against the engine to see how you do. Now, finally, before I let you go, this is the other game that I told you where Botmedic was the black pieces. And the only question that I have for you is, what would be your next move as the black pieces? Well, if you were paying attention, we're looking for a move that is going to open up the position, that is going to create weaknesses for our bishops to put pressure on. So the move is pawn to b5. Now, after b5, just to show you a little bit more, we have knight e1, then bishop a3, putting pressure on the defender of a4. So knight e to d3, bringing another defender. And now a very powerful move that you really need to think to, to find it. And that move is pawn to e5. Now, we don't really mind it if they take, because this knight is tied up to the defense of b2, so they're not really putting pressure on e5. So, after e5, we have knight goes to d1, so getting away from that pressure. b takes a4, b takes a4, and now, before collecting, we're going to take care of this. So, oh, and by the way, guys, same pattern over here, bishop two squares away from the knight, so we're controlling it, e4, hitting that knight, and now we're ready to collect on a4. But of course the white pieces said, no, not today. So knight to b2 protecting. And now we have the very powerful move, bishop h5, simply keeping this king away from the action. If they try to come through here, we could always do bishop b4. And why do we want to keep the king at bay? Well, because now our king could come over and help us even penetrate more. This is just too much for the white pieces. So. After bishop h5, we have king e1, of course check, the king has to go back, and then after king b5, the rest is history. So guys, I hope that this lesson helped you understand how the pair of bishops is better, but more importantly, it helps you remember what to do when you have the pair of bishops. Remember, open up the position, but also try to create weaknesses in the pawn structure, that way you can put pressure on it. And finally, if you have the pair of bishops, remember that you could give it up whenever you want if it is going to help you get something else. So with that said, I'm going to leave it here and I'll talk to you guys in the comment like always.